Next up is um, Don. So here you go, Don. Hi, Dom. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Dom is great, very inspiring um, uh, talk. Um, one of the things that I was really looking to, to get out of this, uh, uh, this presentation or this discussion is how can I, I want to be able to understand um, sort of uh, Catholic theology as it relates to, so in other words, if I'm talking to a Catholic friend mm -hmm. and, you know, they understand their Bible and I want to kind of point somewhere that says, okay, here's where uh, the teachings of Jesus or, or whatever uh, command us to, um, to uh, support women's reproductive rights, abortion, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you could talk to that, if not on the Catholic side, but maybe also on the evangelical Christian side. Um, and, and if not, could you sort of put in the chat um, maybe some links to, you know, liberal or whatever you want to call them, um, theologists, uh, in traditional uh, religions that I might be able to see some of those, um, you know, what, you know, parables or, the, or what, whatever, you know, what parts of those uh, biblical passages I can point to and say, look, read, read that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you, Don. Uh, by the way, you know, I'm Dom, so D-O-M as in Mary, you're Don as in D-O-N, and I'm always correcting people because they think I'm Don, so right. you're my you're my doppelganger in name. Okay. <laughs> um, but to your point, yes, uh, you know, it's interesting because I myself, as, as, as being raised as a Christian, uh, very much understand Catholic uh, ideology and, and beliefs, and, uh, and I, again, I, I, the Bible is something that I've always read the scriptures of. And the very first thing that, you know, comes to my mind, and I'm sure uh, someone on the other side of this issue could say the use the same scripture for their thought. But uh, the scripture of, you know, when uh, Christ Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, you see, that's a very important scripture because really, um, it, it, and also there's a scripture that says, you know, treat treat your it's love love thy neighbor as yourself uh and there's another scripture it'll come to me in a second but the reason why i bring that particular one up don is because really nobody wants to be forced to do anything they don't want to do it's not a complicated thing right none of us want to be forced and by forcing a woman let's say to let's say a I'm going to just say it because I don't know if you guys noticed recently in the news, there was a situation of a young girl who was like 10 years old and she was unfortunately violated in, uh, in Brazil and they tried to force her to have a child. And um, they, she was able to get an abortion, but could you imagine? Oh my God. Right. But the point is, is that that's not a loving thing to do. There was in Ohio too. There was, yeah, yes, Tim, it was one in Brazil and one in Ohio. A excellent. But that's not a loving thing to do. That that young girl has already been through trauma. So let alone put her through this because of my belief, let's say, hypothetically, that I think, you know, she must have this child. You see, that's not loving her. That's actually, quite frankly, putting more pain to her. So that's one thought. There is a, another scripture that is it's Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And you guys, I'm a bit of a, script, a biblical nerd, so pardon me. <laughs> but to Don's answer, Don's question, Genesis two, seven, it's about breath must come first. It says, and the Lord of God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So that's Genesis two, seven, okay? Now, this verse talks about the creation of Adam, and it specifically states that God formed Adam from dust, but he wasn't yet a living soul, okay? So not until God breathed life, breathed life into this inhuman form, did it become alive. So if Adam, the first human to ever exist, had to take a breath before being considered a living soul, literally in the scriptures, if that's somewhat what someone ascribes to, why is the same not true for unborn fetuses? So 
I hope that's helpful to you, Don. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. And the next up is going to be Barbara. So you can go ahead and um, unmute Barbara. There we go. There go. So I have a, an observation or a little factoid of interest and then a specific question. Um, uh, for those of you who may or not be familiar with our military academies, um, they recognized when they founded West Point, the value of an officer corps that was representative of the entire country, that was diverse, which is why very specifically, every congressional district gets an appointment to the academy to make sure that um, these folks in charge of our military, for the most part, did represent all parts of the country. Um, and I have often wondered if literally using the language that is in that charter should be applied to the Supreme Court in some mm -hmm. fashion. Should there have to be one Supreme Court justice from every federal circuit, for instance, mm. as one possibility? Or, and I know many of these judges, it's hard to say where they're from physically because once they left home and went to college and law school and into the judicial system, some of them haven't lived, quote unquote, home where they're from in 20 or 30 years. So I don't know that I would apply that, but I certainly think it's uh, food for thought. Let's put it that way. Um, my specific question for Dom um, is how you would feel uh, as a person of color, especially as a woman, to hear from a white person, especially a white woman, to refer to, I have often been tempted to reframe this discussion of reproductive rights as an ownership issue. Are men trying to own women's bodies? Who owns me? Who owns my uterus? But I've always had a slight, uh, I would not want it to ever be taken as appropriating or in any way diminishing the history of slavery in the black community. So I'm, I would just like your thoughts on that because I've, uh, my background is as a women's advocate, women's everything, I guess you would say. And I have almost started to write a few pieces along that line and thought, no, white woman says that it's going to sound. <laughs> so what do you, what's your thoughts? Thank you, Barbara, so much. You brought up two really, really great points. Uh, I do want to, before I address your second thought, thought a question, I want to address the first thing you said about the Supreme Court, because you make a good point. Now, you know, there are currently nine justices on the Supreme Court, and that is representative of the nine districts in our uh, in our country. OK, now we uh, the, the nine uh, district courts, circuit courts. We uh, it was expanded to nine because it went it went from six to nine. So then we expanded the court to nine. There's an argument to be made, possibly, that we can expand the court because now there's 13 circuit courts. There's an argument. But there, to be but made. there currently is no requirement that says, for instance, if there and even if you expand it to 13, if right now all the judges on there represent say districts one through 12, right. but you have to appoint someone from the 13th circuit. Right. And right now, uh, the, the last I checked, like six of the justices are all from, or five of them from that, from two of the East coast. There's no, there's no one from out West on the court right now. Right. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no one from my our neck of the woods right. from the Ninth Circuit or anything else. So that's that's what I specifically mean about that is that yes. they're to specifically restrict, which would take a constitutional amendment, probably. It it most certainly would. And you know, your point as well as you know, again, the thought of expanding the courts, it, it, it it's all things that we are now discussing as a country. And I quite frankly, Barbara, there are conversations that we need to have because things must change. And in answer to your second question about, you know, using the term of ownership of a man owning a woman's body, 
Barbara, I first want to say to you, and I want to say this to all of you guys, not just Barbara, because I know Barbara's not the only woman on here who's a supporter of women's rights. I'm looking at other women here and men. You guys are our allies. We love you. Um, I know you guys care. And so if I want to say this as a black woman and, and listen, put it on me if anyone asks you, okay? It is completely okay. It is not disrespectful to the history of slavery to say, I do not want these men seeking to own my body because in the ownership of slavery, it was men, okay, who were seeking to own or who were owning the bodies of African slaves for so long. Also, men were also owning the bodies of women as well. Today, we are seeing this, gr this grab. It's almost like a, like, a, like a fearful, terrifying grab to own something. Okay, there's no slavery anymore, right? Okay, we need to own this. We need to own a woman's, it's control. So in answer to your question, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I want to give you lots of love, Barbara, for even asking the question, because, you know, you didn't have to, but you did because you really want to respect and dignify all in your pursuit for justice for women. And we need more women, not just of color, but white women who are in this together. We need you to not be afraid. OK, we need you to know that your voice is important. OK. We need you to know that you are necessary to the fight. Do you know it was white women coming together over the suffrage suffrage movement? And it was those civil, you know, civil rights fighters coming together that move forward our country. So we need each other. We need your voice. And yes, Barbara, you say it. Ownership over your bodies is not okay. You go for it, my friend. I'm going to do uh, my part, it looks like we may be reaching people even here, and we may have a more diverse audience than um, we realize. Yeah. So, all right, so I minor in the study of, let's see, I minored in the study of women and men in society at the University of Southern California, and I learned my law degree at American University, Washington College of Law, which is a law school that was founded by women. I studied constitutional law and authored a textbook on four comparative law and social science <clears throat> entitled Social Issues in Global Perspective um, Pornography. It was an examination of, of social attitudes and laws related to sexually explicit materials in different countries around the world. So I, like Dom, was raised in the evangelical church. Um, I now write and speak about the intersection between religion and politics. And I've been doing a lot of work fighting for democracy. And that's why I started the Truth and Democracy Coalition uh, to help build a movement to save democracy. And I, what I wanna do right now is help you to understand the conservative Christian position on abortion and the role of religion in politics, which I've seen a lot in the chat about already. And first, but first I wanna tell you a little bit about myself, but actually quite a bit about myself. Um, and it's, uh, it may take a little bit of time, but it, I think it's worth telling even for the sake of posterity. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is that when talking about abortion, one should use personal stories. Abortion is a complex issue. Many people are conflicted about it. Even the most ardent pro-lifer has some conflicts about it, um, it, particularly if it's their daughter or if it's them. So I attended a Braver Angels abortion debate, and what I found was that people, regardless of how strongly they feel about abortion, one way or another, have reservations about the impact that the restrictions will have on young women and about the, as well as about terminating the potential child in their womb. So it would be a mistake to assume that pro-lifers don't care about the women's rights and girls' rights 
in this regard, or that uh, pro-choice people are not concerned about the child that they're carrying in their womb and don't have certain reservations about that. So if when you actually listen to people, we might find that they're, they're not as one-sided or extreme, that their views are more nuisance than, than we actually realize. So if you haven't heard of groups like Braver Angels, there are plenty of them. Check them out. A number of groups, uh, Civic Genius, um, America Speaks. These are groups that are working to bring the country back together uh, because it's really the divisiveness. And this is part of the problem that we're having now. Divisiveness is tearing the country apart, apart and fueling the rise of authoritarianism. So that, that's a problem we have to face. Um, last month, we had Dr. Karen Tamirius talk to us about the power of personal stories and, and how to speak to people with whom we disagree. And you can find part one and part two of that at, on YouTube at tinyurl.com slash democracy under fire video or just search for the show or on my podcast. So take a listen to her. She, she has a real good strategy. And there are other groups, people teaching people how to talk to people who we disagree with. Now, let's see. So many people have powerful stories to tell about abortion. And so that's why it's important to have these personal stories, because people can relate to stories and in a way that they can't relate to reason and argument and logic and abstractions. So even I, as a man, I have a story related to abortion. So um, I grew up in the evangelical church in the 70s. My mother, who is with us today and is, is on the call, God bless her, is a committed evangelical um, who has her own nuisance point of view about abortion. Now, as a young man, I knew nothing about abortion. Um, I didn't even know my mother was pro-life or even what pro-life was. In my early years after high school, I went to community college. I took a class on interpersonal communications. And one assignment was to participate in a debate. And the professor asked me right there in front of the class, um, Richard, why, why don't you debate abortion? I said, you know, great. I mean, I have to choose some topic to debate. I just have one question. What's abortion? So I was 19 years old. I just out of high school, 18 years old, 19 years old. I had no idea what a, abortion was. So I went to the library to find out. So I read through book after book from both sides of the debate, you know, and still I didn't understand what abortion was. One side was yelling about their freedom to choose, their right to control their own bodies, how religious people were imposing their views on others and so forth. The other side screaming about abortion being murder and, and baby killing. But none of them actually described what an abortion was. It wasn't, they were all euphemisms. They were all abstractions. And I had a stack of books nearly three feet tall. Still, I didn't know what abortion was. It wasn't until I read a book by a priest that described what abortion was, talked about the conception and the process of abortion in concrete terms that I finally understood what an abortion was. And I didn't necessarily agree with the, the priest's conclusions, but I... I appreciated the clear and detailed and plain language. Um, and in the debate, I would eventually debate both sides of the issue. And I um, didn't really come out with a position on abortion at that time. I was simply, it didn't ha affect me. And I was interested in other things. So 
I transferred to the University of Southern California, and I knew I had some difficulty relating to women. So I decided I would take this introductory class to the study of women and men in society, which is USC's gender studies or feminist studies program. And it was taught by three participants, a gay male professor, a pro-feminist male professor, and a woman. And it had three exams of two midterms and a final. And after each exam, I had a mystical experience. I would turn my exam paper in early and I would ace all these exams. Um, but most of the people would still be taking the exam when I'm walking up the ramp of the lecture hall. And the first time after the first midtime, I saw this ball of light, white light right in front of me. And I probably exclaimed something. I don't remember, but I walked out thinking, wow, I just had a mystical experience, a, a, a experience like uh, Paul had on the road to Damascus. Paul on the road to Damascus had been persecuting Christians. And he is actually the author of multiple books in the Bible. And there are other, many other books that are attributed to him. So, and some people say he's actually the founder of Christianity. And he had this vision where he saw this being of light appear to him as he was on the road to Damascus. And he heard the being of, of light, which he believed was Christ, the resurrected Christ, saying, why are you persecuting me? Now, I thought, wow, that was a really great mystical experience. You come away with this sense of knowing something, but not quite knowing, being able to articulate it. And I thought, you know, I've had mystical experiences similar, not like that, but different ones before. I would have more later, but I, I didn't, exp this is fairly rare, very rare. So I didn't expect it to happen again. But sure enough, on the next exam, I'm leaving the exam, turn my paper in early, walking up, not thinking anything like that would happen again. I mean, how could anything like that happen again? And then, boom, an even bigger ball of white light right in front of me. I must have made an exclamation of something out loud, like a whoa or wow. But I was able to gather myself and leave the class and um, – I was like, wow, I, I really knew I was on the right track, that I had, that it was important for me to take this class that I was learning new things. My professors, however, were not so sanguine or so happy with, with that. They called me in, you know, especially the female professor was particularly upset. If I interrupted the exam or, inter or disrupted the exam, there would be consequences. I tried to explain to them what happened, but I don't, they didn't really believe me. So on the final exam, I'm walking out and I'm saying, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to keep my mouth closed. If this light happens again, I'm going to keep my mouth closed. I'm not going to say, let anything escape my mouth. So I'm walking up. They could be holding and then, boom, this bigger bean of light, this just, and I felt the air rush, the throat, the vocal laces, just to the top of the mouth. And then next thing I know, I'm smelling this acid smell, and I'm looking up, there's a paramedic above me and um, with smelling salts. And they were concerned that it was a seizure or something, but I knew that it wasn't a seizure. So they had a stretcher there. They wanted me to lay down. And, no, I had to get out of there. So I, I just left. But um, so th at that time, I understood. I understood exactly what spirit was trying to tell me. And it was, why are you persecuting women? Why was I persecuting women?
And so that's when I decided to minor in the study of women and men in society. I became a founding member of the Students Alliance for a non-sexist society. I became a feminist or pro-feminist anti-pornography activist. I became enamored with Catherine McKinnon, who is the woman who argued the sexual harassment cases and was a feminist anti-pornography author. Uh, and she developed the theory of sexual harassment. And I started a group called People Against Pornography. And eventually I would write, use all the knowledge. I would go around, speak at different universities, engage in debates and so forth. And eventually I would publish my book in law school, sort of a dissertation like thing. And so like Paul on the road to Damascus, I, I had that type of conversion experience in a women's studies class. So now I want to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court, why are you persecuting women and girls? What does this amount to, this decision, except allowing states to force women and girls to bear children against their will? I mean, with all the technologies that's out there, um, pregnancies can be terminated at very early stages. The Roe decision was a compromise. We've never had absolute, complete right to an abortion at every stage during the pregnancy. That's, it's always been a compromised position to balance the interest of women and girls with the interest of life. And there's a reasonable point at which point one could say that we should allow these women and girls not to be forced to bear children against their will at a point where we say, well, maybe it's a little too late for the, for the potential child. Um, but so the struggle to obey, so we have an unbalanced court and since we get an unbalanced decision and now, and somehow the Republicans have learned to rule by being a minority. And so this battle is now moving to the states. So I want to encourage everyone to, to be involved in that battle at the states, because this is just really one of the first shoes to drop. This is how the, the, what, the regime justifies itself, legitimates itself morally and at the same time takes control and power. So, um, it, so, so we need to, so that's gonna be going at the states and there's gonna be more to come. And really the first shoe to drop was the money in politics and the Citizens United decision. Uh, totally out of line with common sense and values to turn money into speech and corporations into people. That's the first step. Um, we're gonna lose our rights. And this is just the first one. It, there's more coming. And whatever we're doing, we're not, it's not working. 